I almost want to change. Hey guys, Scanner Dander here. Because I'm not Dan. I'm Paul. Scanner Dander is just a name my students gave me 15 years ago before YouTube or anything. Anyway, it is warm and humid today. It's supposed to be 95 degrees tomorrow. And my son, Jake, my oldest son, has this 86 Nissan 300ZX and his air conditioning doesn't work. So he's like, hey dad, can you fix my air conditioning? I said, it is that time of year. Everybody's looking for air conditioning repair type videos and let's do one on your car, Jake. So that's what we're doing. There are many different directions that I can take you. And I think what we'll do first is let's just attack the problem at hand and see what we have and get you guys some quick tests that you can adopt for yourselves. Okay, number one is when you have an air conditioning system that doesn't work is Put your gauges on it. Actually, I'm, I'm kind of conflicted because that's not necessarily number one. Number one is you're inside your car, you hit the AC button, it blows warm, All right? Then what's number two? You can come out under the hood and on this car, it's easy to look at the front face of this compressor. If this front face is not turning with the belt, then your compressor is not engaging. And then I guess step three would be connect your gauges, even though I said gauges is number one. Let's get a pressure reading. But here's the thing. When I deal with you guys who ask me questions about their AC systems, the number one answer that I have in reply is I need pressures to be able to help you. So you have to be able to get pressure readings. Um, this gauge set I'm using is very inexpensive. I don't remember where I got it, but I think it was like 35 or $40. So it's not really professional grade, but I don't do very much air conditioning work anymore. And this is a gauge set that anyone can afford. Um, and you need one. When you're doing air conditioning repairs on your own, you need a good gauge set. Not just low side pressures, but you need high side pressures. These are on already. The Schrader valves are depressed. Check out the gauge. Zero, nothing, system's empty. So we have a leak. I was setting up for you guys and uh, one of the things that I like to do is I wanna be able to see all of the plumbing. To see all of the plumbing, I had to raise the car up in the air. You see the jack and uh, jack stand in the front. And the reason I did that is I can't see the condenser. It's like mounted like this way underneath and uh, I wanna show you guys what I see down there. I, I can actually see an area of a leak. Um, so before we charge this with nitrogen and uh, do the soap and water spray test, which is what I'm gonna show you guys, uh, let, let me show you what I found underneath. When you see something like this on a condenser, <laughs> that's your leak, that's at least one of the leaks. And um, I'm hoping when we do this, there's a connection up at this top right corner. Now I can't really see what I'm pointing at, um, but in this top right corner, there's a connection and a line and there'd be an O-ring there. And I'm hoping it's just the O-ring and it's blowing over onto the condenser fins and it's not a condenser fault or leak in the condenser itself. We're gonna find out here shortly. So all of you at home can do those inspections. Um, it is important to see plumbing. So you're gonna have plumbing from your compressor that's gonna run to the evap core inside the dash, from evap core to compressor, uh, from compressor to condenser, condenser back to the compressor. And of course, depending on your system, there would be either a receiver dryer or accumulator dryer. You wanna eyeball all of those components. That is a receiver dryer. That's on the high side of the system. It has a sight glass on it. And uh, that tells me a little bit about this system that this is a thermal expansion valve system they always combine receiver dryers with expansion valves. Um, that's inside of the dash, it looks like. I can't see the expansion valve, but that's not a big deal. But eyeballing your plumbing is important, and you can see why. I mean, I didn't even have to do anything to identify that I have a leak in that corner of that condenser. Something else to point out, this is an 86, and this has already been retrofitted, and I know that because of the fittings that are on it. So this would have been originally an R12 system, and what, what this had on it was the red and the blue caps, right, high side, low side, and those are your Id identifications right away that somebody has already retrofitted this to the R134A refrigerant. 
you see the caps that thread onto the original R12 fittings. So I'm just trying to cover all my bases before we turn the camera on, make sure I'm prepared for what I need to fix my son's car. And one of the things that I researched was the type of oil because when you have a leak like that, as you can see, you lose a little bit of oil. Um, but the other thing is I have some unknowns here. I don't know how much oil was put in this when it was retrofitted. And so if I'm gonna recharge it today and maybe fix an O-ring, hopefully, um, I'm gonna add some oil to this and I wanted to know what type. From memory, way back in the day, I retrofitted hundreds of these and I remembered using ester oil and I couldn't remember why ester oil was preferred over the PAG oil. So there's your two oils, there's your PAG and ester and there's different weights for these. When I did my RV and I did Caleb's Jeep, I believe we used a different PAG number for both so make sure you do your homework as far as the oil viscosity and and what you should use that's that number after the pag but we're going to use the ester for this and then i did a google search to remind myself i just did a r12 to r134 a oil recommendation that's all i typed in and it says ester oil is recommended by most aftermarket manufacturers and rebuilders ester oil mixes with and is compatible with mineral oil Ester oil can be used with R12 and R134A refrigerants. An ester oil is not as harsh to O-rings, seals, and paints as PAG oils. So when you retrofit these, we, I, I sat in some classes way back in the day, and what they did is they put mineral oil on like a paper plate, and then they sprayed some R134A refrigerant over top of it. So mineral oil is the original R12 oil, and when it's exposed to R134A refrigerant, it turns into like a paste, almost like a glue. So it, it, it's not compatible. And you have to, when you retrofit these, you have to add an oil that's compatible. And you can see why ester oil was the preferred one. Now, PAG can be used as well, but apparently ester oil, uh, it says it can mix with it. I'm not the chemist. So I'm just telling you what we used and what is recommended. You guys do your research on what type of oil you want to run if you're doing a retrofit. For when we're done, I'm just going to add maybe two ounces of ester oil to this. You know, of course, depending on what we do. If we have to replace the condenser, each component you replace is going to require a certain amount of oil. And uh, we'll cover that when we get there. Uh, if it's just an O-ring leak, then I'm not just going to blow refrigerant in it. I'm going to put two ounces of oil in it too, just because of unknowns. I don't want to overcharge it with oil, but I don't want it starving for oil either. Let me start this real quick and I'll show you the front of this compressor. Just watch this here when I start it. And I'll turn the air, air on too. You notice again how the front face of this compressor is not turning. So if you guys are going to message me and say, hey, my air conditioning is is warm, stop blowing cold, and, and I have, you know, 70 pounds of pressure in the system, well, 70 should be enough to engage the compressor. I'm gonna ask you, hey, look at the front face of that compressor, not the belt part, but the front face. Is that front face spinning with the belt? It should be turning, right? That should be turning along with the pulley and the belt. If it's not, that compressor is not engaging. And then we do power and ground testing and things like that. I got a lot of other videos on testing AC systems for no power to the compressor, for faulty compressors. And I'll put a list here for you guys to look at those. All right, so my son's car, you'll hear an RPM change with the blower off. Listen, blower on. It's anticipating a load for the AC compressor pretty crude system as far as that goes because there is no load right now uh, AC buttons right here and did you see that gas light just come on it says gas <laughs> and there's a light that came on now if I shut the car off restart it the gas light is no longer on so it's almost like the system even in 86 is recognizing that it's low on charge. There'd be no other reason to have a light 
above a indicator that says gas, in my opinion, than the fact that, you know, it's low on refrigerant. But that's your AC button. No change, of course, because there's no pressure in the system. And I just found that fascinating that this 86 has a light that says gas. And man, you talk about an electronics nightmare. That would be this car. Let's blow some nitrogen in this and locate this leak for sure. Let's pinpoint the area where it is. From my last video um, where I started using nitrogen, I used to uh, air uh, leak check with uh, compressed air and of course air and uh, the refrigerant oils uh, become acidic and I understand the, the feedback I got from air charging. I, I still think that if you're a do-it-yourselfer and you have a car like this, an old car, and you don't have a nitrogen tank, that you're still better off using compressed air in the system over top of charging it with refrigerant to find a leak. You have a gaping hole in the system, you blow a can in to locate a leak, what did you just do? You just dumped that can into the atmosphere. Um, so just make sure you evac the systems very, very well when you're done. Get all that moisture out of there. Anyway, that being aside, I'm using nitrogen and one of you guys commented about me not having a protective boot around this. It's metal, it covers this valve. And it's important because if this bottle would fall over and knock the end of that off, you're talking about, what kind of pressures does this thing have? I forget. Let me connect to my hose and I wanna just get, get a pressure reading. I forget, I think it's like 2000 PSI that's in this tank. And I have my valves closed up on my gauge set right now. That's important, those are closed. If I turn this guy on, yeah, I got 1500 PSI. I have this regulated at 200. That's what's coming out. This is 1500 PSI. So the point was, if this falls over and breaks the nozzle off, we have a cannon. We have a rocket and it's going to go somewhere. So it was a legit um, comment and I ordered one and the one I ordered didn't fit. So I had to send it back and I forgot about it and never ordered another one. So this is my safety <laughs> right now if I knock the bottle over uh, while we're working that's not gonna happen this is not ideal guys um, think about safety when you're dealing with stuff like this and having that metal container uh, or coupler around here uh, protects this valve from being broken I think that's important so 200 here is what I have this regulated at let's blow some stuff in the system now as far as which side to add to it, it does not matter. There is no low side and high side of a system right now with the system off. So I can put it in either side. I'm just gonna open up my high side and we're gonna put, I'm gonna start with like 150 PSI. Actually, we could probably start with 100 just to see how bad of a leak that is. So those are now closed. I'm like in between 100 and the next lineup. So what's that? I don't know, that's 125. So in between those two, at least from my angle, we'll kind of keep an eye on that. Maybe we'll look at this gauge, we'll get more accurate number. Where are we at? 101 PSI. So really we're looking for decay. How fast does this decay? is why I'm being critical on that number, okay? And of course, where I'm spraying first is my visual inspection showed me where that leak is. That's where I'm going. Just using a soap and water mixture here. Oh, Jake is in luck! Right off the bat, it's the O-ring. That's awesome. No condenser needed. Yeah. So guys, look, this right here is why you never charge an AC system with refrigerant to find a leak. Why would you when you have stuff like this available to you? Again, at least charge that system with air pressure to find it. Don't pollute the environment with these refrigerants. I don't care about the acidic level of the AC system and that when you charge these with compressed air, you make acid if you don't get all the moisture out. I don't care. I'd rather you do that 
than, than contaminate our environment with these nasty refrigerants. I'm using nitrogen, it is the preferred way, but that is an O-ring failure for sure. That's awesome, that's awesome. Okay, so we're gonna spray the rest of the system down that I can see and make sure we don't have any other leaks. We'll do some decay measurements too. That's down to 100, by the way. So that's in itself telling us we have a leak and we'll, we'll use that when we're done as well to make sure we don't have any other ones after we fix that one down there. Uh, but we'll spray the rest of the system. Um, but one of the other things I like to do in this case is I wanna make sure the compressor can engage. And now we have pressure in the system and we can verify that the compressor engages with pressure. And the reason you wanna do that is you don't wanna sell a customer, if this is a paid job, you don't wanna sell a, a customer um, a repair for a leak, say it needed a condenser, which wouldn't be cheap, only to find out when you're done that there's no power getting to your AC compressor. And you wanna know that up front. So I have enough pressure in the system for that compressor to engage. What we wanna do is watch the low side and watch the high side. And it should be like a four to one ratio roughly. Low side should drop real low, high side should climb, compressor should engage. So see if you can get that for me. Closing this off, taking my center hose out of the picture because I need the room. All right, so I'm gonna start it real quick and you're gonna tell me what this drops to and what this climbs to. Can you do that? Yeah. And then watch that front face. What's our prep? Yeah. Sweet. The front face engaged and they kind of stopped for a second. I, the front face engaged and stopped because I pushed the AC button on and off. So it was already on. Yeah. Yeah. So that was okay. Um, I like 40 and 170. Um, when we uh, sat through classes, it's a compression ratio, and they gave us a number. And I don't remember. I remember them saying like four to one or five to one. Four to one. Like if you did 40 and 180, that'd be four. That's a four to one ratio. So that's kind of what we're looking for here. Um, what that tells me is, is a few things. Number one, it tells me electrically everything is working like it should be for that compressor to engage. And number two, it also tells me the compressor is able to do its job. So if you're, you're working on an AC system and it needs all these components and you don't wanna find out when you're done that your compressor's garbage and can't do its job. And this is one way that you can do that without refrigerant. Now the downside of that test is the nitrogen isn't carrying the oil through the system and lubricating the compressor. So you don't wanna do that test for any long period of time, but um, that's a real good quick test to tell you uh, compressor function and, and again, electrically, how is that doing? Now, if you had 100 PSI in your system like I do, and you did that test and the compressor does not engage, what do you do now? As a technician, what do you do? Well even as a do-it-yourselfer that maybe is charging a customer, what you do is you stop and you say, you get back on the phone and say, Mr. And Mrs. Customer, I need X amount of time, usually an hour diagnostic time would cover it, at least get the okay for that, that you now have to attack the electrical system on this AC system and find out why that compressor is not engaging and that's on top of fixing your leak. Anyway, moving on. Um, what do we do now? I have 100 PSI in the system. Let me address this question. Can I charge with more than 100 PSI? Absolutely. On really hot days, high side of the system is gonna see 300 PSI. Low side of the system is generally around 30 to 40 PSI, so it's not gonna see that kind of pressure. However, when you shut the car off, pressure's gonna equalize. On a real hot day with this engine up to 230 degrees and the hood shut and the AC off, you can easily see 200 PSI up at the uh, EVAP core, even though that's the low side of the system. So fire away, man, 200 PSI, go for it. If you can't find a leak at 100 PSI, then put 200 in it. If you can't find a leak at 200 PSI, between, I don't know, I would be uncomfortable with more than 300. So 300 would kind of be my limit on where I'd be comfortable putting in the system, you know, to each his own. Some are gonna argue that I should never go higher than two. Your call, what you wanna do, but that just addresses how much pressure, and that's the advantage of a nitrogen tank 
over compressed air, shop air compressors, maybe 150 PSI max is what you can get in them. And with nitrogen, you can see I can go a lot higher. So advantage again, nitrogen. Still have 100 PSI in this. I'm gonna spray the rest of this down and make sure I have no other leaks. And the nice thing about it, again, oil is a guide. As we saw down below, we had oil residue we use that as a guide for where our leak was. But you wanna spray hoses, fittings. We'll pop these Schrader um, valves off here in a minute. We'll spray those too and make sure our Schraders are not leaking. Over here for my receiver dryer, I have some oil on here, but that may be from this power steering pump and line. We wanna make sure we have no leaks on any of the connections. Any of the ones we can see, there's some down there. Up here at the, at the EVAP core, like where it goes into the dash. I'm gonna spray those down. Just using car wash, 50-50 mix of car wash soap and water is all I'm using. These valves are closed. I wanna open these up. This is gonna take the Schrader inside and uh, it closes it. I'll do the same thing here. I still have 100 PSI in my system. And I wanna spray these guys. Service ports is an area where a lot of people forget to check because you have your gauges on there and you'll never see a leak. So we just want to make sure those look good too. And they do. All right, because I don't want that crap in my, in my lines. Just blowing them out. Put these back on. We have a known leak underneath. We gotta fix that. So at this point, I'm comfortable. I didn't see leaks anywhere else. At this point, I'm comfortable just draining this off. There's a check valve in the end of this hose. So you guys are gonna see that whenever we start charging this check valve, we're gonna utilize that. So when I open this, it's gonna put the refrigerant from the red line into the yellow. If I open the blue, it puts refrigerant or whatever's in there, blue line to yellow. So keep that in mind when you open these valves, what you're doing is you're allowing the blue to attach to the yellow. When you open this one, when you open the red, you're allowing the red to attach to the yellow. There is a check valve here again. So what, what I need to do to drain this system, take the hose off here, and then I can open either the blue or red. And we're just, Draining that nitrogen out of that system. And then I need to get some tools underneath. One of the things I learned about these old Nissans from back in the day, if you have a 10 millimeter, a 12 millimeter, and a 14 millimeter wrench, you could take apart this entire car. <laughs> it's 10 millimeter. You should get a, a shot of the, of the power wagon, man. We, we, uh, I'd like to say I'm done with it. A truck like this, you're never done with. I'm gonna make it. I'm gonna sit here. <laughs> uh oh. It's stuck. What are the chances that this, oh sweet. Oh, this was a Florida car. If this was a Pennsylvania car, that might never come loose. Yeah! That is a cardinal you're hearing. That's a robin. You do this every time we film out here. I'm learning my birds. As I get older, I enjoy those things. As a young man, I never cared. I like birds. I told you oh, I like just dropped it. There she is. Look at that old flattened O-ring. Look at that thing. They don't get much worse than that. That's supposed to be a regular O-ring. <laughs> it doesn't look anything like it, does it? <laughs> yeah. I need some O-rings. Oh, there's a blue one. That's our guy right there. That actually was blue at one point in time. That's the one I'm going to try. You 
You said it was blue one time. It is blue. Oh yeah, you can kind of see it. That's black. That's blue. Sweet. <laughs> We're gonna lube this O-ring too. A little bit of ester oil. Again, do your research on your oil, folks. This stuff is water soluble too, so you don't want to leave it um, exposed. I don't. Maybe water soluble is not the right word. Um, it will absorb moisture. I make sure I don't have two O rings here. I got a feel for it. Okay. Sorry, I can't get you guys a shot of this. So there's really no groove there at all. For this O-ring, just sits along the collar. Oh yeah! What? It fits perfectly. We're gonna re-air. We're gonna re-nitrogen charge it anyway. Okay. Center hose. Let's reattach this. Close these valves, depress the Schraders, back to our nitrogen tank. With our safety, with our safety tires. Oh, we should sell those. <laughs> okay. We're just gonna go 100 PSI again. I could probably go less, but I wanna make sure. Watching the low side. Oh, it went a little higher than I expected. So that's like, get an exact number, like 103 and a half. What do you think? It's Not quite 104. Who's your daddy? Who's your daddy, Jake? Jake's my son who owns this car. That looks good, son. I like it. All right, since we know that our leak that we found is fixed, this decay test we're gonna do, where we're gonna walk away from it for like 15 minutes, we just wanna make sure that gauge doesn't drop at all. And that is just a hair above 103 from my angle. We'll come back in 15. All right, so it's been like a half an hour. That gauge is exactly where it was when we left off. I like that a lot. What I was gonna introduce to you guys today is another way to do a final leak check and that's with a micron gauge. And unfortunately for us, I have a dead nine volt battery for my micron gauge. So I can't show it to you. That's okay. I've done hundreds, if not thousands of AC repairs without a micron gauge. I realized that this is a nifty tool and I wanted to show it to you guys. Um, it's able to read vacuum levels much more sensitive than our gauges. And if you can pull down to a certain level that just ensures you have no leaks. And that's the advantage of this tool. Next time I'll show it to you. For us, we're gonna do it the regular way. First one, it passed, was the pressure test. So I'm gonna bleed this out. That's just nitrogen we're bleeding out. No harm to the atmosphere, of course. Our atmosphere is what, 70 some percent nitrogen as it is. All right, now what we're gonna do is we're gonna pull this under a vacuum. I got a vacuum pump right here. another inexpensive component you can get one of these for 100 bucks 135 maybe I paid for this one back up here you see we're already pulling into a vacuum watch your low pressure gauge I'll have I'll leave both of these open you really don't have to have them both open but watch your low pressure gauge we want to pull very very near 30 and again, this is the advantage of the micron gauge is you get a micron gauge in series with this blue line or the red line, it really doesn't matter, and measure your system and uh, 
it can really indicate much better than this can as far as no leaks go. But we'll let this pull under for, I don't know, this thing was exposed to atmospheric pressure for a long time, I'm sure. So we're gonna let this vacuum pump go for at least a half an hour. And then we're gonna come back, take a look at these numbers. We'll do a final decay test. And we can kind of do that now before we turn the walk away. Let's close these valves. And we wanna watch this gauge here and make sure we don't see a climb on that gauge. If you immediately see a climb with these closed, then that means there's a leak in the system or there's still uh, moisture boiling off too. But that looks pretty good, so we'll let that go. And again, we're gonna come back in about a half an hour or so. And the point of pulling a system under a vacuum like we're doing is we're pulling all of the moisture out of the system. And this oil will absorb moisture too, and so we wanna make sure that we pull into a deep vacuum, which is gonna pull all that moisture out of the system. It boils it off. Um, water actually boils at, I don't know the numbers offhand, but very, very low, low temperatures under high vacuum. So we used to play around in the classroom and take a mason jar full of water and put a vacuum hose on top of it turn the vacuum pump on, you can actually watch the water boil at room temperature. So that's what pulling a vacuum on the system does. As with building pressure over top of a liquid raises its boiling point, pulling pressure away lowers its boiling point, and that's what we're doing here. All right, while we were waiting, I was playing around with my Micron gauge and I found another battery and I do have it working. So get a shot of this first. Uh, what I'm doing right now, is I have both these closed. I'm not pulling on the system, so the vacuum's kind of trapped right here. And I'm just measuring what the uh, vacuum pump itself can pull down to, and I'm showing 520 microns. And I, I don't think that's very good. I think that this pump is not all that great. I, I think from what I was reading, 500 is what you want to at least be able to pull down to. All right, I, had, I know I had 520 here. Let's see what we can pull on the system. I'll attach it here. I had all of those closed. Open that. Open that. Open that. Let's pull a vacuum on this system. I think this is a, a, a worthy tool to have if you do a lot of AC work. If you talk to anyone that does HVAC work for a living, they won't repair systems without a micron gauge. That's your, that's your guy to tell you you have no leaks in the system. Because back in the day, we didn't have these micron gauges. Uh, one of the things about them, or what we were taught is, and actually we've all seen it. We, I've seen systems hold vacuum and not seal under pressure, okay? But the problem with that and that, that mentality and that whole process is you're talking about a vacuum gauge with really, really wide margins for measurements and you can't see those small numbers. And so when you're talking about a micron gauge, um, I don't think that that would ever happen. Like we used to miss leaks using vacuum. Pressure was the key, and, and I'm comfortable with this system and what I saw with it holding pressure for that amount of time. But I guess what I'm getting at is this is another way that we can verify that we have no leaks in a system is if you, if you can pull down to a certain level, and I'll get you guys a number here in a minute. Uh, if you can pull down to a certain level in your system, then you shut it off and you look for decay uh, with a micron gauge, uh, it's gonna ensure no leaks. And uh, it's just, this is new to me, first time I've ever done it. And um, I'm sure there are variables. Your pump is, is gonna be a limitation too in using this tool, I believe. But this is absolutely one where a decay test I can do better. Get a more zoomed out shot. I'm gonna show everyone. I'm closing these valves now. We're gonna do a quick decay test. I know I'm only down to 530. I'd like to see 520 what I saw here. But valves are closed. I have nothing else pulling on the system, even though you hear the vacuum pump running in the background. In fact, I'll shut it off. 
and you talk about a decay test, one that you can see accurately, it would definitely be that. You walk away from it for X amount of time, come back and take a look at it. Micron gauge. First time using one. So be looking forward to your comments in this one. As far as usage, what you guys are using, what kind of numbers you wanna see, what are your variables? I'm at 520. 520, is 520 good? Oh, I'm down to 510. All right, at this point we wait now, Caleb. I wanted to at least show the Micron gauge. We'll talk about it a little bit more. I'm gonna let this vacuum pump run for a half an hour, like I said, and we'll come back. I'll get you some better numbers on this Micron gauge. Um, there is something I forgot to do, and we don't wanna continue pulling uh, a vacuum on this and then add the oil later. I wanna put the oil in. So I, I said I was gonna put two ounces in this using the ester oil, and I have a milliliter beaker here so it's like 59 milliliters is two ounces so we're gonna put we're gonna put two ounces in this and uh, this system holds five ounces of oil um, when it's empty just an FYI okay let's turn this pump back on and what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull it in through the high side. You can do it on either one, but I don't want it getting into my micron gauge. So we're going to go, we're going to pull on the system from the, from the low side. This is still pulling and then open this and I'm going to suck this in. Cool. Now we're getting all that atmospheric air back in the system as you can hear. I'm gonna leave this closed because I don't want any of that oil being pulled back out. So we'll just pull from the low side now only. So um, what we're looking for is really under a thousand, what most of the guys using this micron gauge. So zero to a thousand, they're saying is a clean leak free system. Uh, 1,000 to 2,000 we got moisture present above 2000. We have an atmospheric leak. And um, so those are just some numbers. We were able to pull down to like 510 and uh, watch that pull down some more here. Um, again, it's a tool that's available to us. I think it helps. Like I said, I've been doing this for many, many years without a micron gauge, but that doesn't mean that this gauge can't help us in the future. Um, something else as we're watching this pull back under is this has been a retrofitted system and charge capacity is 32 to 38 ounces. So we'll just call it 36 for easy math with the cans because they're 12 ounce cans. If we were putting R12 in this, we'd use three 12 ounce cans, but R134A is a different molecule. And so there's a conversion. Um, the the conversion is, uh, I found this on the internet, the formula would be R, R12 charge um, times 0.9 minus 0.25 pounds. And so as an example, um, we'll call this a two pound system because I said 36 ounces is how we're gonna charge. It said 32 to 38, we'll go 36, which is exactly two pounds. So two pounds times 0.9 minus 0.25 would be 1.55 pounds and um, the conversion for that for ounces is 1.55 pounds is 24.8 ounces. So what we're gonna do is we're only gonna put two cans of R134A in this, as opposed to what the spec said, which is three if we were using R12. That's the plan. We'll see what kind of pressures we have when we're done, but that is the plan. All right, we'll come back to this. We'll let this pull all the way down. I, I pumped a whole bunch of atmospheric air in there. That's why it's taking some time to come down. We'll come back to you guys in a half an hour. Once again, um, after putting oil in this, we pumped all kind of air in the system. So um, we don't want to just let that go. Like you don't want to do the oil addition the way I added it. You don't want to add that after you pull a vacuum on the system because you're pulling air back in it. So we got to wait another half hour.
All right, we're back. Um, I just shut the compressor off and I closed these valves and take a, a look at our micron gauge. We're sitting at 500 microns. So that's even lower than I could get it when I tested it on my compressor. I'm sure if I would have let it run longer, I could have got 500, but I'm gonna say 500 is as low as that compressor or vacuum pump is gonna give me. I keep calling it a compressor, I'm, I'm sorry about that but we're just doing a final decay test right now. So I'm anxious to hear your guys' thoughts on the Micron gauge and what you think of that number. Again, 500, 510, 520, that's the most I could get from that compressor itself when I was just on the yellow hose. Uh, so I'm absolutely comfortable with this number regardless. Um, again, the material I was reading, uh, many, many of them comments said 500 um, microns is what you're looking for. And uh, this is a real nice decay test too. So I got hot water sitting here. We're gonna charge using that with the cans and I need to put a Schrader valve in here. All right, so that's my timer from when I shut this off and take a look at the micron gauge. It's at 510 and I believe that 510 to 500, it was kind of hovering right around that, that range. I'm gonna give it five more and we're gonna watch it. I wanna make sure that that's not climbing. There is a check valve on the end of this yellow hose. So keep that in mind as we're charging that uh, I'm gonna utilize this check valve for me. In fact, me putting this additional Schrader in here wasn't really necessary. Can tap. Heard a little bit of flow there. It looks like we filled this yellow hose. It's okay. I'm not gonna start charging yet. I wanna watch that micron gauge. So Caleb just asked me, did that go up by 10? And I said, yes. However, this goes in 10 increments. So it's either gonna be 500 or 510. So we were five minutes in when it went from 500 to 510. We're now eight and a half minutes in. It's still sitting at 510. So we'll go till 10 minutes and I'm gonna call that good. Now, of course, you can, you can do leak checks for a much longer period of time and there are decay tests you can do with this Micron gauge. And again, you guys that are following this video, read the comments. There's some smart people in here that are gonna give you some good guidance on using this Micron gauge, probably better than what I did. And let's get a stopwatch here. I'm 11, I'm 11 minutes in and I did jump up again. It's now at 520. So what's acceptable? What's not? How much of that increase right there is from minutes, minute, minutes, minute amount of moisture still boiling off in the system? And I'm looking at vacuum levels I've never seen before. So these are some of the variables. You're, you're allowed some rise here. There are variables with this. And this is where the comments are gonna come in. I am comfortable with this. It didn't fail the pressure test when we were done. That's my most important thing for me. As far as these micron uh, increases go, you guys, I'll let you guys be the judge. I'm comfortable with that. But there's something else I'm not comfortable with. Take a look at my gauge setup. And I don't know enough about this, this tool. I don't want to add refrigerant I always like to add to the low side. Of course, with it running, you never add to the high side. You only add to the low. I do have the ability to charge this system with the high side with it off using hot water, but I don't want this micron gauge in here anymore. And my issue there is exposing this to moisture and I don't wanna do that. So um, we're gonna stop with the decay test. I am, let's see how many minutes in we are. 12 minutes and 41 seconds in. I'm good with that. I'm taking this off. So we're gonna close this valve to isolate this. And then I don't have a check valve in the end of this. I'm gonna close, that one's already closed. Um, I want to reattach this to here without really exposing much atmospheric 
moisture. And this, this isn't ideal, but I'm gonna do it. Just stay there. I am being a little picky here, guys, as far as what I'm doing and why. I just wanna make sure I'm giving you guys good information, that's all. So I don't have a check valve here. I just made a check valve. So we're gonna take that off of there. I'm wondering if I set this up differently next time I can avoid this. Okay. So I didn't expose the system to any more atmospheric air, but I'm wondering if I would have set this up now thinking about this. Yeah, I should have put, I should have put the micron gauge here and then the blue hose here. Ouch, should have done it that way because then what I could have done is simply unscrewed the micron gauge and there's a check valve there. That's the way I should have done it. And then I could have left this in the rest of the time. Oh well, live and learn. All right, so my uh, Schrader valves are still depressed. I can add to either side of the system with the engine off. In fact, we could blow some in this high side line just to clear out the oil. I wanna do that first because I added oil to here. And so let me uh, just kind of open this up and we'll open the high side port you see the liquid flowing in the sight glass. You'll see low side pressures climbing. And I'm adding that as a liquid. I'm just kind of flushing that oil out of this red hose and down into the system. That's the discharge of the compressor too. And then once you hit pressures that are equal outside, so it's like 90 degrees outside, and roughly 90 psi that pressure temperature relationship it once we get 90 in the system it's not really going to flow any more in and so that's the purpose of the hot water so you just dunk your tank dunk that in the hot water and watch your pressure up here so that can it didn't really rise anymore that can is pretty much empty we'll let that go for a minute i'm going to close my high side service port really important i'm going to start this now i'm going to add the rest of this to the low side we do not want to add to the high side with the compressor running uh, and then just because i put oil in here manually uh, i'm just going to turn the compressor face by by hand to just push any thing out of that compressor should it happen to be in there um, just being overly cautious, but when you put a new compressor in, you wanna do that too. Some new compressors will come with oil inside of them. And you don't wanna overcharge the system either, which is a common mistake. Remember your system has oil all through it. Some of these compressors, when you replace them, will have a full system charge of oil in there. Yeah, you don't wanna use that. You wanna dump all that oil out and maybe only add an ounce to a compressor replacement if that's all you're changing. All right, but we're good. I'm gonna start this. Valves are shut. That can's open, but these valves are closed. So nothing else is gonna flow in here. We'll be able to watch those pressure readings. As soon as I start it, that compressor should turn on. Did it turn on? Sweet. All right, let's continue adding on the low side. Keeping in mind, I'm adding right here, which is this, the suction line. So we want to be careful that we don't dump liquid into here. So with the can, this is empty now. I'm, I'm basing that off of pressures here. You can watch my low side pressures. Like there's nothing else. There's a little bit left in that can. But if you add with the can straight up and down, you're adding as a vapor. If you add this way, you're adding as a liquid. And when you're adding to the compressor with it running, when you have a low side service port that's that close to the compressor, you can put liquid refrigerant in the compressor and ruin the compressor. So just be careful with what you're doing on that front. Okay, um, we do have six feet of yellow hose, six feet of blue hose. By the time it gets there, we can argue that that is gonna be 
of vapor anyway. You just want to be careful with what you're doing. The only reason I'm shaking the can is to feel the liquid level that's left in it for no other reason. You'll see, you'll see people charging AC systems and they're sitting there shaking the, hand, the can the whole time. Totally not necessary. Only reason I shake them, so I can feel the charge level. All right, so that can is empty. I'm not gonna be able to get any more than, than that 30 PSI out of there. So we're gonna hear a little uh, hiss at the end. Never add to the high side again. This one's open. We'll close this. Don't really have to, I have check valves here. Take this off of here. A little bit of hissing coming out of the can, just some vapor at the very end. Nothing you can do about that. You cannot get all of it out. We're going two cans. Again, utilizing check valves at the end of this. I'm not flooding this hose with atmospheric air because I have check valves here. Or did I? I just did. So, so think about this. I have a check valve that's depressed here. I remember this now and why I, I didn't want to, that was dumb. So I put a check valve in the end of this thinking, oh yeah, I'm going to be good because I have a check valve there now. No, when I have this in here, I, what I did as soon as I took the can off is I flooded this yellow hose with atmospheric pressure. So it was good that I shut this off. And so that's, that's going to need to be purged. So I'm going to show you how to do that. And we'll do that differently next time. I should have taken it off of here. That was just dumb on my part. All right, so you got a hose that's full of air. What do you got to do? You got to purge it. And to purge this line, we'll go liquid. These are closed. Watch up here, just real quick. There you go. Lines purged of air. Okay. Now, is that legal to do? I don't know. Sometimes you have to do it. You know, you can't prevent all refrigerant from going to the atmosphere. That's how you purge a line without a vacuum pump. I'm not going to pull a vacuum back on that line just so I can hook it up to another can. No, that's how you purge a line. All right. Adding back to the low side with it running, being aware of my liquid vapor scenario. Open this up. And we'll keep an eye on our high side gauge as we're watching the low side. And I really brought the hot water. I guess I really don't need it since I'm now adding with it running. I was planning on adding with it not running, which I can do. Let's stop this for a second and I'll do that. So I shut this valve, still got a bunch of liquid in here. <laughs> You're going to reach a point again of pressure equalization where you can't add any more once the pressure in the system equals the can and that's what the hot water's for. So we'll, we can now go as a liquid too. Adding as a liquid, look at my gauge up here, watch. See the refrigerant flowing in? So that's how you can add to a system that has 125 PSI rest pressure in it right now. It's because I got hot water and I'm heating the refrigerant. And it's, it's really a much safer way to do it when you have a line as close to the compressor as we do like this. So variable methods, many different methods, not cans, just about empty. So I'm gonna close that off for a minute. Start this back up. Raise our RPM a little bit.
Judging by my high side pressures being at 225 and climbing, almost 250 now. I definitely don't want to put any more refrigerant in. Refrigerant in, I think the two cans was the right call, the 24 ounces. I think if I put more in this, it would our head pressures would be too high. We'll get some uh, discharge air temperature readings here in a minute. We'll keep watching that. What I should have done if I was gonna add another can is again, close this up here first, in case you do something wrong. And what I should have done is I should have separated it right here. So now that check valve is being utilized. And then there's a check valve on the end of that. Now what I can do is take this off and go right to my next can. And then that's how I should have done it. And I separated it right there. So that was my fault. Get an idle pressure reading there, Caleb. Let's get my thermometer and check it inside. This thermometer's seen better days. But what we want to see, I mean, we always wanted to see like 40 degrees of discharge air. And um, last time I used this gauge, it was way off calibration. One of you guys called me on it. You can calibrate these. I was like, oh, I got to get a new gauge. You don't. You just need to mix ice and water together and then put the thermometer in it and set it for 32. <laughs> Science. <laughs> so you can adjust these. So I'm not sure that that's accurate. Okay. I need to, I need to go get ice and water and, and calibrate that. <laughs> Ice and water. This is some science if I've ever seen it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it makes sense, right? I'm showing like that that is 75 degrees. <laughs> Clearly it's not. I'm gonna move it around for a bit. 32. I'm just warming it up with my hand. Now we're up to about 80 degrees. Okay, put it in the vent. You know, on a day like today, I don't think you're gonna get 40 degree discharge air, but ideally that's what I'm looking for when I do AC work. I wanna see, I wanna see a 40 degree discharge air. Now, of course your climate is gonna matter. Is it really humid? You know, it is really humid today and it's really hot. It's probably, I don't know, 85 degrees today yep. and really humid. I feel like this one, he's got some ductwork issues here, Caleb. I'm gonna go in this one. He's got, he's got better airflow here. You wanna feel that kind of bite on the back of your hand when you're putting your hand up on the, on the vent. A day like today, I'll take 50. I've heard other people say you should get a 30 degree temperature swing from outside air to you know, here. So if you're in Arizona, it's 110 degrees. You're not gonna get 40 degrees of discharge air. Now I'm at 1,500 RPM. I bet you we drive this, get a little bit more airflow across the condenser. We probably get a little bit better numbers here too. It looks like 50 dead on. I think it'll be even cooler when you're driving it too. I'm perfectly fine with these numbers. This looks great. Nice, easy fix for my son. Cost me like 50 bucks in material. And honestly, I have two extra cans. So I only use two cans. Uh, final idle numbers, about 28 PSI on the low, looks like about 210, 215 on the high. Those numbers might be a little bit low. I, I bet you this could use, let me go a little bit higher RPM and watch it. I bet you this could use a couple more ounces. Let me see. That's at a higher RPM. I, I feel like I feel like I could put like six more ounces in this. I'm gonna do it. See if we can get that 40 degree number too. Thought we were done, but 
those numbers are low. I, I was worried about the high side pressure before, but it's come down significantly. I'm gonna put like, I'm gonna charge now based on the, on my high side pressures. I don't mind like 250. We were under 200 for a day like today. Again, it's gonna vary. Remember 32 to 38 ounces of R12 is what this system called for. And I only put in 24, okay? All right, we're gonna add this as a vapor. Just a little bit at a time. dropping even lower it shouldn't be oh compressor shut off dumbass watch that again what something's not right i want to see those high side pressures come higher and i, I want to see low side around 30 High side, a day like today at a, a higher RPM. I mean, 250 easy on the high side. That looks pretty good right now. I feel like maybe we, we got a little bit of a TXV that's sticking and these numbers to me, even though I added about a half a can more, these numbers look like we're still low on charge. Watch my pressures when I raise it. Low side drops pretty low, and the high side's dropping too. Like we're not pulling enough in to compress it to make the high side higher, and I forgot about one piece on this. Systems that use receiver dryers will often include a sight glass, and you can use the sight glass as a guide to charge level. There shouldn't be bubbles in the sight glass. And it, what looked like an undercharge to me it's, I, I'm, is confirmed by this sight glass. I'm gonna keep going with that can in spite of the numbers that I looked up. 32 to 38 ounces, or was, yeah, 34, yeah, 32 to 38. Um, I'm, putting, I'm putting the rest of this can in, or at least I'm gonna watch this sight glass. As I'm adding re refrigerant, I'm just gonna add to the low side now. I'm gonna watch my high side pressures. I'm still sitting about 200 PSI, about 210. We're just gonna go the full 36 ounces of this, this third 12 ounce can. I put half of it in before. See some better pressures than what I was seeing. All right, let's stop there. Now I'm at 250, 35. going and there's only there's only an ounce or two left in there i'm not going to add any more than this can but take a look at the sight glass now as i add the rest of the way uh compressor just disengaged so we gotta wait till it re-engages there you go look at that see how clear it is now see how the bubbles are gone 36 ounces was what this needed now, what we don't know about this system, when it was retrofitted, it is possible that, that someone replaced this compressor with a larger compressor. I don't know. It's possible. All right, compressor's running. 
as you see with the gauges, those pressures look pretty good. 35 and 250. Come over here, look at the sight glass one more time. It's nice and clear. And then let's do a higher RPM test and then we'll do one more test inside. So raising my RPM, let's watch these gauges. Let's go, well, I'm not gonna add any more. I'm comfortable with that. So the final piece I wanted to show you before I realized we were still undercharged is this. Let me show you. Let me close these off. This can's empty and done. We're gonna utilize this check valve on the end here. Step one, take your high side service port unwind it which closes the Schrader so now you've trapped that 250 psi in this line okay step two open your high side valve there's a check valve here so we're not going to vent it all that high pressure is going to go in to the yellow hose it's sitting right here step three open your low side slowly and pull all of that refrigerant in from your red hose and your yellow hose into your low side of your system. So watch, gauges are dropping. We got 30 on the low and 30 on the high. And now what we do over here, take this and open that strader, open that valve which closes that strader. These are both isolated now. And all we have left in the gauges is rest pressure. That's it, 30 to 40 PSI. Shut your car off. You can let this high side dissipate if you want to before you take it off. We don't have to, that's it. And what that did, that final step, is that kept all of that pressure from maintaining or being in those hoses. And uh, you know, you're supposed to recover your gauges when you're done. You don't wanna vent that to the atmosphere. And being that I don't have a recovery machine here at my house, um, that allows me to have as little as possible left in the gauges themselves. Okay? Put my caps back on. We're done under the hood. Close this up and we'll get back inside for a final temperature measurement. I'll pull over so you can get a shot of this thermometer. I'm showing, I'm showing about 42 to 44 degrees of discharge air on like a really, really freaking hot, humid day in Pittsburgh. The third can and a test drive was key. I like it. That's great. That's like almost 40 degrees difference of outside air. And those numbers that I gave you guys as far as the conversions go, um, those aren't my numbers. That like 0.9 times the amount, minus 0.25. I just Googled that. I remember when, when we did these, it was 10% less. We just we just did 10% less when we were charging with R134A from an R12 system. I think it was 10. It, it wasn't significant. And I was putting a significant amount less in this. At first I was comfortable with it until I saw those pressures as I'm revving it, seeing the low side drop and the high side drop. I was worried about the expansion valve and uh, the sight glass was really, really helpful in this case that you know, we were able to use the sight glass for bubbles, which is another way that you can um, charge a system. You just keep going. You got one of these systems. Just keep going until your bubbles are gone. Make sure the compressor's running, of course. Dude, it's freaking freezing in here. Here, get a shot of this now. We're like at 40 just above 40 and this v6 has enough torque with the stick that i really don't feel the bog in that compressor these smaller cars when the ac turns on man they can really you know pull the power away from the the car and this feels really good jake's gonna be super happy he gets his nissan back with a 
working AC system. Sweet. So, yeah, thought we were done a while ago. I have the gift of gab. There's a reason uh, I've been teaching for 20 years and sometimes it's to my detriment and yours. But if you made it with me this far, again, I'll put links in the description of this video for other AC ones that I've done. And uh, I, have, uh, I have ones out there, guys, that are uh, dealing with compressors that aren't kicking on with good charge, um, electrical problems, bad clutches, uh, bad compressors, you name it, I have them. Check the description. Guys, thank you so much. We'll see you next time. All right, so as we're sitting here in the air conditioning in my truck and it is, it's temperature outside. It's freaking hot, man. It is 91 degrees outside with a 75 degree dew point. Um, just wanted to uh, talk about my son's car we did yesterday real quick. A couple things. One is I have to apologize. Using a tool for the first time live in front of you guys does not always make for the best training video. Um, because I learn things along the way and I say things that are incorrect and, and you know that's just the way it goes we film live we don't do anything off camera so you take the good with the bad um, but this micron gauge what I wanted to talk to you guys about is some things that I learned last night that I didn't know and they're basic things uh, you'd think that I would have understood that at the time, but I did not. And one is is what a micron is. I, I wanted to equate microns to inches of mercury for vacuum measurements, and so I did a quick Google search, and it's one inch of vacuum, one inch of mercury, is the equiv equivalent of 25,400 microns. And that makes sense, that's a number I'm used to using is millimeters to inches. Well, there's 25.4 millimeters in an inch. And so that number kind of, you know, goes hand in hand there too. So, but think about that for a second. 25,400 microns in one inch of mercury. So why is that tool um, so valuable in leak detection? Think about this for a second. As an example, if I'm at 29 inches of vacuum, or if I'm at 28.9 inches of vacuum, I'm never gonna see that on my, on my gauge, on my conventional manifold gauge set. I'm never gonna see that 10th of an inch difference in vacuum. So if that vacuum would drop a 10th of an inch, I would never see it. I can barely see the difference between 28 and 29. So now think about that for a second. A tenth of an inch, move the decimal one place, that's 2,500 microns for a tenth of an inch drop. And I was worried about a 20 micron rise during our decay test. I hope you guys are following what I'm, what I'm saying here. That number is so small, it's so small, if a tenth of an inch of vacuum is the equivalent of 2,500 microns, <laughs> right? What am I worried about 20 micron rise? So the decay test, of course, we're gonna see some increases in microns and they go by tens. Um, what's acceptable is gonna be different probably for every system and everybody's gonna have their own opinion on what's an acceptable decay test for microns. The other thing is, what is an acceptable number to pull down to? I have a friend I spoke to, and he told me he uses really anything below 750. Um, I read some other material that are saying anything under 1,000, and we were at 500. Something else that you wanna do is baseline your, your I keep calling it a compressor still to today, uh, baseline your vacuum pump and see what it can produce and ours was able to pull down to around 500. And so um, as far as what's acceptable number to pull down to, it's gonna depend on the system you're working on, it's gonna depend on the pump that you have, so baselining your pump is important too. Um, so, so that's it, I think the Micron Gauge is a very valuable tool in that it may eliminate the need to have to repressurize the system 
when you're done. Take my RV, for example. We did a, 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 an evac and recharge on my RV, and that's a system that holds like five pounds of refrigerant. It's a huge system. So for me to re-pressurize that system when I'm done fixing the leak with my nitrogen tank, I'm using up a lot more of my nitrogen than I want to. Micron gauge is gonna come into play there. You, you pull that under a vacuum, you're gonna see it. If you have a leak, you're gonna see it. It's just not gonna pull that low. And uh, use my 10th of a, an inch uh, example again, that's 2,500 microns. You're gonna know it, you're gonna see it. Um, I'm still good with the, the tests that I've done over the years and not using the micron gauge. I'm just introducing that tool. I think it's very valuable again. And is, is there ever a scenario where we can, we can hold um, vacuum but not hold pressure? Um, I still think that that is possible, but uh, be anxious to hear your thoughts on, on if the micron gauge ever misses it. Have you ever seen one? I've certainly seen systems hold vacuum and not pressure. But I don't have a gauge that's that sensitive. And that's the point. So be curious to hear your thoughts on what you guys have seen on that front. Um, Micron gauge is pretty sweet. And um, sorry for uh, not really knowing what I was doing with that tool yesterday, but uh, we, we just wanted to do this follow up to uh, add some clarification. So thanks again, guys, and, and we'll see you next time.